Well, welcome back. Now you can see that uh, I'm in different surroundings this time. Um, word to the wise, when the senior pastor does a whole lot of work on stage to make it look like a winter wonderland out of the Victorian era, you take advantage of it however you can. And what's really cool is that 3 John deals a lot with hospitality and being hospitable to people who actually want to follow Jesus Christ. So um, I think that this hospitable kind of scene works pretty good. Okay, so today we're going to start talking about 3 John. And uh, I'm going to read it to you just like I did last time, and we'll talk about it as we go. So here we go. 3 John, verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Uh, you know, the last, the last book, 2 John, uh, was written to the lady uh, who we knew in the Greek was uh, uh, Kyria. And um, we, we don't know if that's her name, of course, but, but uh, we talked about that last time. Uh, Gaius, he's, um, he's kind of enigmatic. Uh, we don't really know who he is specifically. There's several Gaiuses that were mentioned in Scripture. The first one was a traveling companion of Paul uh, in Macedonia. And uh, we find him uh, along with Aristarchus in uh, Acts 19. And so it's a possibility that it's that Gaius. In Acts 20, we have a Gaius from Derby who is mentioned as one of Paul's seven traveling companions. Um, and he waited for him at Troas. And that's Acts 20, verse 4. There's also a Gaius who's mentioned as being uh, in Corinth, as being one of only a few people that Paul baptized. Uh, Stephanus and uh, Crispus were the other two. And so that's another possibility. Finally, there's a Gaius mentioned in the final greeting in the book of Romans. Um, and so that's our, our final idea of, of who this could be. Uh, and and it, may, it may be none of those. Actually, Gaius was a very, very common Roman name. The Romans only had 16 male first names. Um, Gaius was one of them. Um, uh, another one was Marcus. Um, there, there, there was 16 of them. And so what you do is you, you would actually combine that with your family name. So like in Julius Caesar's case, his name was Gaius Julius Caesar. And so it meant Gaius, and Julius is the family name, and then Caesarus uh, was a title given to him later. And so you always you would have names uh, added to the end. Um, and like uh, Scipio, a guy named Scipio, that is actually his family name. I can't remember his, his, his first name. Um, but Scipio Africanus, when he defeated Hannibal in Africa, was, was added that. So that's how the Romans did their name. So, I mean, Gaius, even though we have several examples of Gaiuses in the New Testament, um, there is by no means... Uh, a definitive answer as to which one it is, because there were thousands of Gaiuses alive at this time. I have read some commentaries that say that uh, it's probably the Gaius from Corinth, but again, it's it's kind of an iffy thing. I mean, how many people were named Gaius? I mean, seriously, you know, one sixteenth of the Roman population was named Gaius, of the male population. So, I don't know. Let's go on. Verse two. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. This does give us a clue, because even though John may not have brought this guy to Christ, it sure sounds like he had a great deal of influence in Gaius' life, and because he calls him one of his children. Now, he may just make a, a broad general statement to all the children of, you know, of, of the, the family of God. But it's possible that Gaius was actually a, um, a protege of John. So it just, that, that's, one other, that's one other element we have to kind of insert into this, is that it doesn't sound like he was the one that was under Paul, um, if that's the case. Of course, it very well could have been, and John just could call everyone his children. And that's fine, too, I suppose. Um, but I want to point out that it says, in all respects, you may prosper and be a good health and be in good health. It is not wrong to pray for prosperity or health or whatever, um, but it is, you know, God is not some impersonal force that, you know, when we pray a certain way or we say certain things that he just responds all the time. That's called magic, okay? And, and, and the scripture specifically forbids that kind of thing. You know, if you pray this prayer this way, you know, God says, you know, we don't want to, uh, don't pray. Jesus said, don't pray um, with, with vain repetition like the heathen do. They think by their many words are going to be heard. You know, God is not some impersonal force. We have a relationship with our creator. 
And so uh, make sure, you know, as, as you look at this, we want to make sure that we understand that it is not a prosperity gospel that is given here. It's not wrong to pray for health. and <laughs> It's not wrong to pray for wealth, I guess. But James does point out that if we pray uh, for things, we don't, we, first off, we don't receive because we don't ask. A lot of times we just don't even ask. But there's other times we don't receive because we ask with the wrong motives. Um, so in, in one sense, you know, for me to pray that someone prospers in, in many ways, you know, that's not wrong. Um, uh, you know, there's no sin in that. Um, but I do want to have the right heart about it. You know, I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm praying out of a genuine love for the person um, and, and uh, you know, with, with a very sincere attitude of submission to God. If I have a prayer that is saying, God, give me or give this per person wealth and, and health because that's the kind of God I want, um, well, that's the wrong attitude. And uh, people who, who point out prosperity gospel and really try to say, hey, you know, you can name it and claim it, uh, for your own selfish ends, uh, really haven't understood uh, the Bible in its full context. In verse 3, he talks about your truth. Okay, he says, uh, they testified to your truth. And, and he qualifies that. He says, that is how you are walking in truth. Okay, um, this could be taken as, as a relativistic kind of passage. You know, he testified to your truth. Uh, I've never heard anyone do that with it, but I just want to point out, it's not relativism. Uh, it is, in fact, he's talking about the, the reality of, of, um, of Gaius's walk, that, that Gaius has owned it. He's like, yeah, this is your truth too. You know, you, you own this, man. You're walking in it, all right? You, it is part of your life. And I think that's more what he's talking about there. Um, it is not some sort of relativistic, uh, you make your own truth and, and apply it however you want kind of thing. That's bad doctrine and really bad, selfish kind of motive there. Verse four, he says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Man, I don't know how many of you are, are parents, um, but I, I bet you are like, man, I, I, I identify with that. Uh, that. One of the scariest things to me is the possibility um, that one of my literal children, um, my, my biological children, would not come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is just a, a horrific thought to me. Um, and, 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 of course, John here, it sure seems like he's talking about the family of God here. That, that's, that's totally in context for him to be talking about, you know, um, all my children in, in, in the kingdom of God. Um, but, you know, I really identify with that. And, and, and even, even in the sense of, of metaphor of, you know, uh, some youth kid that I've, I've had an influence on or whatever, them walking in the truth, that is, that is very edifying, um, you know, encouraging. It's, it's not building up my ego, uh, or it shouldn't be. Um, but it is encouraging, and it's it just, you have no greater joy when you see someone just like completely and totally walking in the truth. That's really awesome. Um, on the other hand, um, it's pretty tough when uh, people you love and you've, you've invested in and um, you think uh, the world of don't walk that way. And uh, so I, I identify with John. I don't have anything particularly doctrinal uh, to say about that, but I do think that's um, very something I very much identify with. Let's go on. Verse 5. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men, so we may be fellow workers with the truth. You know, we can, we can support people in a lot of different ways. And I know, you know, anytime you hear from ministries, they're like, hey, um, we want you to, like, be praying for us and, like, serving us. But then they always get that, you know, hey, we want your money, you know. And, um, but, I, you know, what is I supposed to say? You know, I, I, I think all those things are legitimate. You know, the financial need really is there. And we can, and what's cool about that is, is that we actually can join in a ministry when we invest in them, whether it is our time, whether it is our prayer, or whether it is our treasure. Um, that is absolutely being part of that ministry, you know. And so John says, hey, let's join with them. Let, let's support them. And, of course, here he's talking about hospitality. Uh, and hospitably, we can, we can support people, too. You know, if a missionary comes to town or whatever, I can let them stay at my house. I mean, it doesn't cost me much to do that, but, boy, it sure makes a difference for them. Uh, you know, and, and, and we do want to invest. And I think it's really neat, you know, at other points in Scripture— Obviously, Jesus is sending certain people out to go, you know, to the Gentiles and, and to go across the world. And, um, but there's other people, you know, Paul even says, 
make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You know, there, there, there's there are people who it's okay that God has given them the task of building up resources for the kingdom and, and living out their life faithfully right where they're at. Right where they're at. Um, of course, that's not an excuse for us to, to not do what he has for us to do. That's not an excuse for us to disobey or just to sit on our, our rear ends all day or not be part of a fellowship or something. But, but it is um, true that God uses um, people in many different ways in the kingdom. And I think that's pretty neat. Who loves me first among them does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either. And he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. I was reading a commentary. Um, it's called Barnes Commentary. And he says this. It says, It seems to me, therefore, that the fair interpretation of this passage is that these brethren had gone forth on some, other, some former occasion, commended by John to the church, and had been rejected by the influence of Diotrephes, and that now he commends them to Gaius, by whom, they had formerly, by whom they had been formerly entertained, and asks him to renew his hospitality to them. Um, it is possible that um, John is talking about some people maybe that were even sent there by him or by the church, um, you know, people they knew to be um, solid believers. You know, I, I'm not sure... Um, you know, if John hears about this, it wouldn't make much sense if he didn't know the caliber of the people that Diotrephes was actually rejecting. Um, it's possible, but, but not very likely. And so it seems to me, it seems to me that it makes sense that, that those guys were people who came from maybe the, the Jerusalem church or, you know, wherever John was. Maybe he was in Corinth. Maybe he was in Ephesus. I don't know. But uh, wherever he was at, they, they maybe gone out and he knew of them and they had been rejected directly by, by Diotrephes. And if you look into it, he says, I wrote something to the church. Is it possible it was Second John? Uh, you know, if, if you look at some of the, the, the text of both of them, it's really close. And, and, and that can be explained somewhat by having the same author, but it almost sounds in some ways like it's the same day. I know I'm a little out of context here, out of time as far as where we're, where we're at, but if you look at verse 13, uh, check that out a little later. Verse 13 and, and Third John, and then look at the end of Second John, and uh, he says... He says, uh, I'm not willing to write you, them to you with pen and ink. I don't know about you, but I, I tend to write, like if I'm writing several letters or several cards or whatever, I use the same kind of, you know, words over and over again because it's, my, it's my, where my mind's at and I've already kind of, you know, figured out what I want to say. And so uh, it makes sense. It's possible that this is written on the same day. Um, it's possible that it's written in response to the response that, that um, John got back from Second John. Maybe Diotrephes wouldn't accept it. You know, who knows, you know, what, what the case may be. Um, but it says the Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Boy, that guy is into self-glory and self-pride. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure I could always make that call on somebody. Um, you know, we don't want to judge. We don't want to judge the heart. Um, but John has seen uh, maybe a bit more of this guy's heart um, than, of course, we have. And, and so he can, well, you know, I'm going to accept what he says about the guy. Um, but he says, if I come, I'll call attention to his deeds, which he does. And I found this interesting because in Matthew 18, you know, Jesus says, you know, if, you're, if you have a brother in sin, that you go to him one on one. And then you take a, uh, another brother, you know, if he doesn't accept what you say, you take another brother. And if he still doesn't accept what you say, then you, take, then you bring him before the congregation. If he still doesn't accept it, then you throw him out of the congregation um, and treat him like an unbeliever. It doesn't mean you don't love him. Of course you love him. Um, but you don't bring him into fellowship anymore. He's considered not part of the fellowship uh, any longer. And um, so I find it interesting that John's willing to do this publicly, um, but this is clearly a pattern behavior. This is clearly something that's been gone, that has happened for a while. Um, and, you know, maybe, who knows? John doesn't say exactly how he's going to do it. Maybe he'll go to him first, you know, on his own. Maybe, maybe you know, maybe he's not telling Gaius every detail. Um, but I think that if somebody is saying things publicly, um, sometimes maybe you need to address them publicly. Um, it's not just for that person's good anymore. You're dealing with other people as well. And um, that, is, that is kind of a hard question sometimes, especially when you get into church leadership and church discipline. You know, when do I do things publicly? You know, when do I talk about um, those circumstances? And, you know, I've dealt with a lot of circumstances uh, through the years where people have not um, done things the way they, sh they should be done. They've not loved people the way they need to love them. Um, you know, and I haven't always done everything right either. You know, and, and it's okay. People can hold me accountable. That's fine. 
Um, but they have to deal with the same question. How do I hold someone accountable and, and under what circumstances? Of course, Matthew 18 is, is what we need to go to. Um, in fact, I'll read it to you. Uh, it says, um, it says it's 18, verse 15 and seven, through 17. It says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So, um, you know, Jesus does give us kind of a, a, a modus operandi for how to deal with uh, people in the church who um, need to have discipline. Um, and, of course, we don't know. You know, John may have, may have done this. We, we don't know. Um, but I, I find it um, an interesting conversation to talk about when things should be dealt with publicly. All right, looking again at um, verse 10. You know, he says, he, says he, he forbids those who desire to receive the, the real brethren and, and even puts them out of the church. It just, it just occurs to me, you know, why? Does it matter, again, why we have biblical leadership? Does it matter who's in charge? Yeah, it matters who's in charge. It really does matter who's in charge. Um, and, and, and I think this is something that, that um, bears thinking about. Um, you know, it's not, on one hand, it is not legitimate for someone... Um, on their own accord to uh, elevate themselves to leadership. Um, by the same token, we also don't want people in leadership that are merely um, elected in uh, by popularity. You know, I mean, leadership in the church needs to be from somebody who is genuinely trying to follow hard after Jesus Christ. And maybe Diotrephes was at one time. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously, he has a great deal of influence. And it doesn't say that he is um, straight up like the, the, the guy over the church, but he evidently has a great deal of, of influence. And uh, so it, it does matter, though, who's in charge. And, and it does matter that they're godly. It matters that they're not um, self-seeking. You know, it sure sounds to me uh, like it's the beginning of, of a cult, you know? Um, it, in verse 10, it says, uh, um, oh, yeah, it says, he unjustly accuses us, you know, John, with wicked words. Well, that sounds like the beginning of the cult, doesn't it? I mean, like, he's, he's, like, trying to get followers after him. He's putting people out that don't agree with him. In Acts 20, 29 and 31, it says, I know that, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Man, these are guys that he loves and that he knows are legit followers from your own number. There's going to be guys that, that rise up to try to lead the flock away. We've got to be careful. You know, we've got to be careful um, where our heart goes. We've got to be careful where our, our mind goes. You know, what you dwell on, uh, you dwell on, on Christ— that's, that's great. That's good. That's what's going to center people on Christ. You dwell on Christ, and you, you bring people towards Christ. You start dwelling on things like, man, I should be getting more recognition for this. Or, you know, I should have this, or I should have that. You start doing those kind of things. You start thinking about, man, I just can't, I can't stand that guy. You know? And, and, you know, it says, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is a good report, think on these things. Why? Because, we, first off, because we're believers— all right? And we want to have hearts that are clear and clean before God. But think about it. If you're always thinking about negative stuff, you're probably going to start acting negatively. Negativity. I mean, that, that's, that, is, that is how selfishness kind of gets going in the heart of a believer, you know, who's going to lead people astray. They're, they're, going, to be, they're going to be fixating on things that are of a, of a selfish bent. And um, so, I, you know, I want to encourage you. Make sure that your heart, your mind is set on things that are from above. And... Um, I want you to know that Jesus, when he said, you know, turn your cheek for your brother, or not for your brother, for someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other one also, he meant that. I think a lot of times we try to um, get people to do what we want. I think a lot of times we try to get people to do things our way, and there's nothing wrong with having an opinion. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being very adamant about your opinion, Okay. And say, no, I think it works this way because of that. You know, whatever, that's fine. But at the end of the day, submission is the key to unity. All right? Paul talks about it in Ephesians. And Diotrephes is not doing that. He is not submitting to the leadership of the church. 
to fellow believers. He's doing things his way. And um, I think a lot of times we, we really don't submit very well um, to one another. I think we want our own way a lot. And um, if it's not our way, um, well, sometimes we throw people away. And that's not okay. He goes on. He says in verse 11, he says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony. And you know that our testimony is true. He just kind of says, you know, don't imitate what's evil. Diotrephes is clearly doing what is evil. Don't imitate that. You know, don't, don't put Diotrephes out of the church just because you don't like him. Now, he might need to be removed from the church for discipline. But don't remove him just because you don't like him. It's, it's hard to deal with him. You know, that's not the reason why. John even didn't say he's going to kick him out. He says, I'm going to call attention to his evil deeds, though. You know, Diotrephes might leave. You know, that's a different thing. Um, but he's going to call attention to it and say, listen, what you're doing is wrong. And uh, we don't want to imitate what's evil. You know, imitate what is good. And interestingly, it says the one who does good, um, that is a, a continuous action. Um, it is the present active participle uh, when he says does good and, and he does evil. Um, it's present active participle. It, it is continuous action. It is not, doesn't mean that some guy who uh, helps a little lady across the street one time um, is of God. That's, that's not, what he's, it's not what he's talking about, okay? And he says the one who does evil has not seen God. Doesn't mean somebody who one time yells at somebody and then like repents later uh, hasn't seen God. He's talking about re re continuous repeated action. And uh, that's a big deal. You know, Greek, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I, do I really need to learn Greek? Well, sometimes it's kind of a big deal. And this is really, really, you know, a reassuring to me, the guy that makes mistakes, you know, um, to, to be able to read this and say, oh, Lord, thank you that you're not, you know, just throwing me away because I made one mistake. He doesn't, you know. Uh, he loves me anyway, and he loves you anyway, even if you make a mistake. Um, and obviously, when he says the one who does good, you know, he's talking in context of believers. Okay, he's talking in context of believers. He's not talking uh, to non-believers here, all right? So he's not telling some Buddhist, hey, if you do good, you've seen God. He's not saying that. He's talking to believers, okay? So just stay with believers as far as the context goes. So why Demetrius? Um, well, the possibility is that he's actually the, deliver, the letter delivery guy. He says, hey, this guy Demetrius, uh, he has a good testimony, right? He re he's received a good testimony. We, we've talked about him from everyone and from the truth itself. Obviously, biblically, this guy is living the way he ought to, okay? Um, and then John says, hey, I add my testimony. My name's on the line here, okay? He's putting his name on the line, uh, his, his reputation on the line for Demetrius. Um, so I think uh, that uh, John really believes in this guy. And uh, so Demetrius is kind of going in under the radar. Uh, Diotrephes doesn't necessarily know he's coming. And Demetrius is going to Gaius, and he's kind of, you know, getting ready, maybe even for John to come, um, and definitely to deal with the problem, you know, to start helping the problem be dealt with. Verse 13. I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Um, I, I do have a, you know, kind of a question there. You know, why aren't the friends mentioned? Um, it is possible they weren't mentioned for protection from Romans, um, but he mentions Diotrephes and Demetrius. You, know, you could say, well, he mentioned Diotrephes because he's an enemy, you know, I mean, but then he mentions Demetrius. I, I don't see it as, as a, a protection. Um, it is possible that um, he didn't mention it for their protection from Diotrephes. You know, maybe he was trying to protect him a little bit, also, um, paper's expensive, and if you don't have to specifically, you know, mention the people, maybe he just didn't have enough room. I, I don't know. You know, there's really no specific reason why that might be, but those are some ideas as, as possibilities as to why. So, Second and Third John. Um, you know, Second John really deals with how um, we we don't want to be accepting of the ministry of people who are going to be counter to the cross of Christ. Uh, we don't want to accept people who would. Uh, insert their own truth into um, their messages and, and, and instead, of, instead of God's truth, you know, something that is counter to God's truth. Um, and, and so 2 John really deals with that, and it's like it's saying, hey, listen, if there's somebody who is this savage wolf, you know, this, this, this wolf in sheep's clothing, we talked about in Acts, as, as, as Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders, you know, when we have this person that is, is trying to um, get people to follow after them or whatever, we don't accept that, okay? On the other side, we have in 3 John, 
the the other extreme where somebody this diatrophies guy was trying to get rid of uh, all kinds of teachers uh, but they were the wrong teachers to get rid of is so that he could himself have followers after him it really sounds like and so um, you know Paul is saying no let's be hospitable to those who are really are of the truth and I think it's interesting because you know on one hand you have hey let's get let's not accept the ministry of doesn't mean we don't love the people but we don't accept the ministry of people who are not of the cross of Christ and then on the other hand, we say, but I need to accept those who are legitimately following after um, the cause of Christ and, and really are after, the, you know, uh, supporting the cross and, and the message of Jesus Christ. And, you know, because it would be really easy as a believer to say, oh, well, I just won't accept any of them. I won't, if people come, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be hospitable um, because it's really hard, you know, and to me, for me to ask all these questions and Man, I can know all this stuff about doctrine and all this stuff. And, and that's not totally true, actually. There's a few things you do need to know. Um, but, but John doesn't say that we can just kind of sit on our rear ends and, and just throw all of everyone out just to make it easy on ourselves. You know, he has the one side where we get rid of those who would be um, damaging to the church. But we don't just get to get rid of the ones who would be helpful to the church. We have to be wary. We have to be aware. We have to be um, seeking out... The right answer is to find out, you know, test every spirit, find out if these people really are from Christ, if they really are of the of, of Jesus Christ, if they're really after um, his glory. And um, I think it was really cool. Um, you can kind of see this in action in Acts when um, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, I, that's how I'm going to pronounce it. Some people say Priscilla and Aquila, whatever. Anyway, they see this guy, Apollos, um, who is preaching. And he only, he only knew about, like, John, uh, really, but he was, he was preaching accurately about the kingdom, um, except for he didn't know who Jesus was. Rather than saying, look at you, you're horrible, what are you doing, you don't know anything, you know, rather than tearing him down, they took him aside, it says they took him aside privately, and they, they asked him, you know, asked him questions or whatever, and, and explained to him more fully who Jesus Christ is. Then he went right back out and he started preaching Jesus Christ. This guy wanted to follow he wanted to follow after Jesus Christ. So just because somebody has a little bit of, of a mess up doesn't mean we throw them away either. You know, we really do need to ascertain what their heart condition is, where they're really going, who they're really trying to follow. And then we either support that ministry, you know, as, as God gives us uh, ability and means, um, or if they're going counter to the cross, we, uh, we may be kind to them, but we, show, we, don't, we don't support that. And uh, we don't allow them to damage the church of God. So I, I find that interesting that 2nd and 3rd John really do balance each other out, uh, and I think that's a, that's a neat thing, and it's a very needed thing. Uh, it's kind of amazing. It's kind of like the Word of God is written uh, in a very amazing way to change us and to, to give us right instruction so that we actually do what we're supposed to do. It's pretty cool. Anyway, you guys have a wonderful day, and we'll talk to you later.